Welcome to Equal Justice Podcast, a forum for all who seek truth, value tradition, and defend the foundations of a moral and just society. Uh, today, I'm honored to have uh, with us a special guest, Dr. Kenneth Neherbas. Welcome to the show, Dr. Kenneth. Thank you for having me. Uh, I've had the privilege of knowing Dr. Neherbas for the past seven years. Uh, he has taught missiology at Biola University, uh, Belhaven University, and Liberty University. Uh, he and his wife were missionaries in Vanuatu, uh, a South Pacific nation. Uh, they served with Wycliffe Bible translators and completed a translation of the New Testament in the language of Southwest Tana, which is the language of one of the islands, I believe, in Vanuatu. Um, he is currently the instructional designer at Ca California Baptist University. And he has authored, authored many books. Uh, his recent book, uh, which we'll be discussing in length in our show today, is titled Advanced Missiology, How to Study Missions in Credible and Useful Ways. Um, this book actually received an award of merit for 2022 in the category of World Christianity from Christianity Today. So I just wanna congratulate Dr. Nervas for this award. And yeah, before we jump into discussing your book, uh, tell our audience, what does it mean to be an instructional designer? And what, do you, what is it that you do? Okay. Well, I work with professors uh, to understand how to make sure that the uh, learning activities that they design and the assessments they design are actually fulfilling what they promised the students uh, from the beginning. So okay. you are, if, if you say that students are going to, for instance, in a missiology class, uh, are going to understand trends in world Christianity, then have you chosen the right uh, term papers, the right readings, the right lecture times, discussions to prepare students for success in that, and then have you actually measured that? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so choosing learning objectives, um, and, and so it has to do with the educational effectiveness and accreditation. That's that's wonderful, uh, um, and as I mentioned, we'll be discussing your book today, and it deals with the very question of or the commission uh, of uh, going into the world and making disciples. Uh, so I would start by asking you, what, how do you understand as a missiologist, the whole idea of discipling the nations? And um, how do you define nation? And how do you define mission? Okay, well, uh, controversially, <laughs> <laughs> any one of those definitions uh, would be controversial within the field of missiology. First of all, discipleship. Uh, I think that the notion that a disciple is someone who's made a commitment, who has risen their hand to call, or who's been baptized, those are probably not the best definitions. When Jesus said, go make disciples, he said, teaching them to obey all I've commanded you. Mm -hmm. Something central to discipleship seems to be obedience rather than just decisions. Uh, and I think that more and more missiologists, church planners, pastors are beginning to understand that making disciples isn't just uh, preaching a message and having people raise their hand, but it's teaching them to obey all he commanded. Now, the all I commanded is difficult. Yeah. Because is it all the red letters? Is it the New Testament? Is it the full Bible? Is it a, a shorter set of commands that uh, Jesus gave, like love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength in your neighbor as yourself? So... Uh, I, I'm not too picky about that. Uh, I think that it's generally following the principles found in Scripture. Hmm. All I commanded, you know, Jesus, as as uh, the Son of God, has commanded what is in uh, the Old Testament as well. Yeah. And we understand that there are some commands. He says, you know, about uh, the Sabbath, for instance, that He's fulfilling them rather than, um, you know, obliterating them. But in general, it's, it means to teach people to have a biblical worldview, to obey uh, biblical principles. So that's, that's how we define discipleship. Uh, now, uh, nations is an interesting one because most missiologists in the 70s and 80s began to, deter, uh, to define the term ethne, nation, in, in the Greek New Testament. 
uh, or as it was translated in English, nations, tribes, you know, um, as a people group, and ethne was a people group. But now in 2022, we have begun to understand that there is no such thing as these hom uh, homogenous, bounded, firmly set in stone people groups. And just to give an example from where we did our um, Bible translation in Tana, uh, people would marry uh, outside of their ethno-linguistic group. They would marry people from the other uh, from the other side of the island who spoke a related but different language. And so the Joshua Project would say you're marrying a different ethnic, you know, a different ethnic group. Wow. Um, and yet almost everybody did that. Mm -hmm. And there was no homogeneity. Everybody was intermixed. And then when you begin to realize that that's what my neighborhood looks like, that's what my university looks like, no one is one bounded ethne. Uh, everybody's mixed somehow. Mm -hmm. So I think we moved away from this notion of there's this set of whether it's 5,000, 7,000, 15,000 ethno-linguistic groups, and somehow there's a checklist. Okay, we have preached the gospel to this one. We have made disciples of this one. I really think that what Jesus was saying was keep preaching it, keep making disciples, keep making them with all sorts of people, with urban people and and northern people and southern people and you know just and just keep making disciples of people all people and uh rather than getting hung up on what is this this term ethne so i think that's controversial but i think more and more missiologists are are coming to understand that that's the best we can do with that term yeah uh, before getting into the main idea which uh, i would really want to come into um in terms of your book um, you named your book Advanced Missiology. Uh, do you think there is uh, there was a need to title it that way? Is there some issue with the old framework of missions? Okay. Well, you know, I picked a pretty uh, boring title. <laughs> and uh, I, I, th I thought this is not going, if people buy books based on the title, they're not going to <laughs> pick this one up. I did kind of need to warn the reader, this is a textbook. You know, this is not seven ways to make disciples in the next month. Mm -hmm. There's there is heavy interaction with theory. You, you get into anthropological theory and uh, theories of development and uh, theories of education, um, theological theories. So I did need to kind of, you know, admit that in the title. Um, now. Uh, the, the missiology part, you know, some have some even don't like that term because it's actually half of a Greek word and half of a Latin word. <laughs> and, um, well, what is that? You know, what it, is missiology a field in its own? So I do I take a chapter to explain what I mean by that. I think I have a pretty normal view of what missiology is, but I, I do constrict missions is making disciples across cultures. And when I say across cultures, I, uh, again, I pick a pretty narrow definition. I mean, across uh, ethno-linguistic boundaries. So it's people who speak a different language or identify as ethnically different than you do. Mm -hmm. And you know that those boundaries are blurry. Speaking a different language, is it 50% different? Is it 20%? How different does it have to be for it to be different? Yeah. It's, you know, I know it's blurry, but I still think it's a much uh, stricter definition of missions than, um, you know, just teaching people who are different because they're a different generation than you are or because um, they live in a different state than you do. I, I'm saying it's making disciples across ethno-linguistic boundaries. Uh, would you say uh, a geographical location would kind of play a role in that kind of understanding? Well, not as much. Uh, I do think that your genuinely engaged in cross-cultural discipleship when you're working with international students on a campus, uh, when you're when a when a South Korean church in Los Angeles is reaching out to Cambodian refugees. I do think that uh, there another definite another component of being a missionary is being sent. I mean that's right in the word, right? That is what um, mission is, is being sent. Uh, so does that mean that you need it to be your full-time job, that 
some church needs to officially commission you. Um, I pretty much decide, in, in, you know, if, if we need to define, define the term, yes, it's someone who is recognized as being sent for the purpose of making disciples across cultures. It doesn't have to be a certain amount of miles from your house, but you do need to be sent out. It's not just, um, it, well, you know, we had a, a couple that used their retirement to move to Tana Island for the business. They were Christians. Uh, they were not sent. So there was not the level of accountability of goal setting. Um, and they were, their income was coming from their business. And so they had to make business decisions. Uh, there are some who are sent from the church to do business as mission, but they weren't. They were using their retirement, you know, this, this was their retirement plan. And so we're kind of on that blurry uh, area of are they missionaries or not, but they were not recognized by a, a group as having been sent out for the purpose of making disciples. Uh, as a missiologist, would you say that you can see a shift in terms of not just sending missionaries out to other parts of the world, the global south? The missions is right here in our corner of the world that we are in here in the West. Um, and we, I'm sure we want to get into talking about the missiological theories and models that you talk about in the book and how that facilitates the Great Commission. Um, uh, so so are, you, are you seeing that kind of shift that's happening, that there are missionaries coming in here in, in, into the West and not just reaching out to the diaspora, but also to the Western church here? Yeah. Yeah, and there's kind of different names for each of those approaches. Uh, some say reverse mission. For Now, reverse mission is different than, for instance, a Nigerian church uh, in Nigeria sends its leaders to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, to plant a church to reach Nigerians. That's not actually missions. That's homogenous, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's trying to reach people of, Again, there are 450 ethno-linguistic groups in Nigeria, so it could very well be missions in the sense of reaching people across ethno-linguistic. Mm -hmm. um, but um, some who are involved in that, in those efforts, you know, I'm thinking of a Nigerian student, a doctoral student, who's saying, from his standpoint, that is not reverse missions, that's just church planning. Yeah. You know? uh, but uh, there also is this reverse missions going on where it, especially when we think of reverse migration the, the way that term originally was used was Spain colonized South America and then indigenous peoples of uh, South America went back to Spain because of some connection through colonialism um, similar with linguistic backgrounds that um, back to Spain to write to try and reach Spaniards or um, Brazilian nationals going to Portugal and such. Uh, so we do see that kind of reverse missions uh, as well. And, and, you know, we we know the churches that are growing in Western Europe are uh, the churches from the majority world. Yeah. Uh, and as you may know, uh, uh, Dr. Nervous, that uh, I'm one of the missionaries here who come from India. And the, the much of my focus in terms of missions is the church here in the West and how people could be reached um, uh, with the gospel message here in the Western context as well. Um, in your book, you talk about um, something called a metaphor of a river, which is different from the old framework of stool with three legs. Um, can you elaborate more on that in terms of what you mean by the metaphor of river with tributaries and distributaries and how is it different from the old framework? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you took missions in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you learned that missions stood on three legs, uh, theology, history, and anthropology, and that it was the convergence of those three that helped us to make disciples. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we've noticed, is if, you were, if you look at how is missions actually done, like if you were to take the last 100 articles in Evangelical Missions Quarterly and Great Commission Research Journal and Missiology, are they really relying on history, uh, anthropology, and theology? And you might find an article that relies on none of that. And in fact, something related to member care might relate, uh, might rely more on psychology or counseling therapy. 
uh, you might find a study of Genesis that uh, not only deals with Bill studies, but with sustainable development theories. Interestingly enough, and that's an example from a, a missiological article in, in the Journal of Missiology. So what I discovered is that missiology doesn't stand on three legs, it's actually multiple influences. Sometimes it's education. These wane and, and they ebb and flow uh, because you might find for a period, maybe from 2000, 2010, orality was a, was a theoretical discipline. You know, the cognitive studies of how do people learn? Do they learn in concrete terms or abstract terms that orality influences missiology for time and then it wanes. And another th uh, theoretical concept comes in it may be from, um, you know, critical studies, neo-Marxism or something, you know, something from the social sciences or um, uh, we, don't, we don't know what's next. But there's nearly endless disciplines which have been, it's not exactly co-opted by missiologists, but leveraged for the purpose of understanding how to make the cycles. So these... Uh, these, instead of seeing missions as a stool where the three legs are a finite length, they're set uh, and there's only three of them, I see missions, missiology instead as a river where there are multiple influences and then there's kind of ideas being ferried upstream and downstream because for the past 200 years as missionaries have gone cross-culturally, they've learned linguistic data and anthropological data which they have in turn used to influence the fields of anthropology, the fields of linguistics, uh, and and even um, brought more broadly into understandings of economics as we as we learn about more market systems throughout the world. So this in there's a two way street here or a two way river really up and ferrying up and downstream in missiology of influencing the, the theories that actually we also co opt for the purpose of understanding how to make uh, disciples across cultures. Uh, so the, the uh, model of a river allows us to see that it changes over time. You never step in a river, in the same river, twice. It's constantly changing. And that there are also, uh, there's convergence for a purpose. And the purpose in missiology is for making disciples across cultures. You could integrate theology, history, anthropology for some other purpose. But it's the purpose of making disciples across cultures that makes this interdisciplinary um, endeavor actually called missiology. Um, how would you set boundaries in terms of, because there could be a lot, many ideas from these disciplines that may be taken into missiology and applied in different contexts. Um, how would you say that we need to be also be careful as to that we are not just adopting everything because it seems to be working in that particular discipline? Because um, it may not be uh, sustainable, it may not be um, biblical in some sense, some of the ideas that have trickled down from academia, for example, uh, from sociology department or anthropology department. Um, if we adopt those ideas and apply that in missions, um, I believe it could do more damage than good. So how do we set those boundaries, knowing that what we are taking in um, is relevant and biblically sound? Yeah, that's the purpose of setting very narrow definitions. Missions is making disciples across cultures. Now, the, the main kind of critique I've gotten from the book from academic reviewers has been, he sounds like an American evangelical because I've said the purpose of missiology is to, is to further the work of cross-cultural discipleship. And there are many who disagree with me. There are people who write on the history of missions for other purposes rather than making disciples across cultures. As a matter of fact, they would describe that as triumphalistic, um, you know, neo-colonialism. Mm -hmm. So some, uh, as uh, Alan Yeh, another professor at um, Biola, uh, explained in his book, Polycentric Missiology, some study the history of missions just to see it because they see it as a fascinating subject. So their purpose is to uh, is is just to further their understanding of um, you know something that's fascinating rather than how can we learn from this how to make disciples across cultures. And so I say you can do history for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you might have a critical agenda, uh, a neo-Marxist agenda, but when you are doing it for the purpose of understanding how does the gospel spread across cultures, then you're doing it missiologically. Uh, but yeah, there are definitely those who would uh, disagree with me on that. Mm -hmm. now, now you talk about um, adopting these ideas and having this uh, interdisciplinary approach to missions. Uh, uh, would you say the church had been successful or mission had been success successful in informing those disciplines of what missions have learned? Not um, tremendously successful for some of the obvious reasons. Anthropologists have kind of a love-hate relationship with missionaries. Um, they're not lining up to hear what we've learned, <laughs> you know, in our cross-cultural settings. Some of that's our fault. We haven't always had learning attitudes. We haven't always been um, shining scholars in our fields that would make our, our secular peers want to know what we've learned. Uh, and of course, by deliberately choosing the purpose of making disciples across cultures, that alienates some of our fields who, who feel that, you know, they don't, then they don't want to have anything to do with us. But there are great examples of uh, how missions and, and um, academic missionaries have influenced their fields. And Stephen Pike, one of the uh, early founders of, of Wycliffe Bible Translators and Summer Student Linguistics, uh, was a tremendous linguist. And he saw part of, you know, one of his paradigms was, yes, his goal is to make disciples across cultures, but there's also value in and of itself of academic study. It's not like you study just for the purpose of making disciples across cultures, but that uh, recording languages is valuable in and of itself. Hmm. And learning how the mind works. Why do we need subject, verb, object? Why are there not languages with object, verb, subject? You know, and, and pondering like, how are we hardwired as human beings was a worthwhile um, endeavor. And so he did that linguistically. Uh, and so there are some examples where, uh, cer certainly as you get into how have missionaries furthered uh, micro finance, medical missions, um, we, are, we are furthering uh, both theory and practice that matters for the world. Mm -hmm. uh, how to develop the poorest of the poor communities, how to be advocates of um, communities, how to, how to bring in dr drinking water, uh, you know, that sustains and some are too busy to do the academic part and to publish their findings. But as we learn best practices, we do improve um, endeavors that are also of interest to the secular world. Um, based on my experience in Christian institutions that have um, theology department and they have missiology department, they don't want to call it that, they may name it something else like intercultural studies. I see that there is, um, somehow there is this dissection between these two departments. They don't come together. Do you think there's a need for us to maybe bring together theology and missions uh, and you know, bring them together under the same fold? Is there a need for that? Yeah. Uh, I think that what you find often is there are uh, people who've served long terms in the long term in the missionary, you know, in the mission field, and who have gone on and gotten. PhDs in New Testament. And so they're not teaching missions, but they have missions backgrounds. And I think that widens their understanding of the world, um, helps them see how people outside of their own cultural background have interpreted scripture. And so that can help. That can help as they relate to students who are outside of their own cultural background. Uh, but it also can give us a, a more rich understanding of scripture. Hmm just by traveling, you know, just by spending prolonged periods uh, or see, and prolonged periods where we're listening um, cross-culturally. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, there are some specific theological questions that really easily intersect with the study of missions and some that are less so. For instance, you know, what is the nature of someone who has never heard the gospel? Uh, what's, what it, 
are they are they destined for eternal conscious torment in hell or um you know what is what is their destiny for someone who who never hears the gospel that's a missiological question and so and it has implications mm-hmm. for church planting and for how we allocate our resources for missions so there's where theology and missions really need to be um talking uh, i think this is a great seg- segue to the other topic a uh, key topic that i want to talk to you about today one was the whole idea of interdisciplinary approach to missions and uh, the other is the idea of contextualization and you argue that uh, a certain kind of contextualization that is ethnotheological uh, which includes in, in your words, mission history, uh, denominational influences, view of scripture, plus the traditional culture and traditional religion. Uh, what do you mean by ethnotheological uh, you know, uh, contextualization? And I have one more question. Uh, when we talk about missions, we go into uh, nations and, uh, and we engage with them um, in their context and we try to contextualize scripture uh, to the culture in which they are. Um, do you think there, there is a need for us to contextualize the culture to the gospel culture that we all, regardless of where we are, uh, uh, come to when we come to Christ? Yeah. Well, when we look at the word contextualization, first, I think it's important to remember that there are two things people mean by that. First is contextualizing the medium, and then there's contextualizing the message. The medium it tends not to be very controversial, and and it is an essential part of contextualization. So the medium would be: Is it appropriate when you're planning churches in the South Pacific to meet outside under a banyan tree rather than in a, uh, you know, a concrete permanent? Yeah. Um, and is it appropriate for? Should the should the leaders be wearing black trousers and white shirts? Where that's very difficult for them to get hold of, you know, uh, and, and so can the clothing be contextual? Um, do they need to have an organ? Do they need to have guitars? What is the, you know, the medium for this? Uh, and so that tends to, while there are people exporting their musical instruments, their clothing styles, their building styles into other cultures, uh, in general, I think we've learned the last 200 years, we need to contextualize the medium. Now, the message is the more con- controversial question. Um, A big controversy within Wycliffe Bible translators was in Islamic contexts, Jesus uh, calls God his father, and so Jesus the son of God, and that's seen as blasphemous in an Islamic context, and so do you contextualize the message and therefore not use that term son of God? Because it only because within that context, Son of God only takes the connotation of someone who, uh, you know, through relations, uh, marital relations, has, has given birth to a child. This would mean that Jesus is other, other than God. And so you're actually um, not retaining the doctrine of the Trinity by using the phrase Son of God in that context. Well, I never worked in the Islamic context, so. Um, I don't really get involved in that one, but that's that would be an example of a very sticky missiological uh, question. People took both uh, sides on that one. Yeah, given that I've lived in Muslim countries uh, for quite a bit of time, uh, I, I would say that um, maintaining that idea of uh, Jesus being the son of God and our job to explain it as to what we mean by that has brought many I- I- into the faith, uh, saving faith of Jesus Christ. Uh, there is, uh, that's my experience. That's what I've seen in missions among Muslims. I work with missions organizations that are focused for, uh, among Muslims. So uh, I would say there is, there is uh, definitely, because the, the question is as to if we do that with son of God, we'll have to do with that with many doctrinal um, uh, it, you know, issues that we have developed reading the scripture as to what scripture has revealed to us. Um, having said that, with this whole idea of ethno-theological, um, I was wondering, you talk about mission history, denominational influences, view of scripture, uh, as well as the traditional culture and re- traditional religion. Um, how much important do you think in terms of missions is eschatological position of people going into uh, a culture? How much does that motivate them? 
uh, uh, in their call for mission. Yeah, in other words, if Jesus is coming back imminently, does, is that more likely for people to enter the missionary field and to be engaged in church planning and proclamation rather than digging wells and long-term education efforts and such? Yeah, because uh, I think if you are more of a more dispensational premium position, it's, it's all about proclamation of the gospel, saving people as many as you can, um, uh, but not much emphasis in terms of how much what a saving people do to their culture or to their nation, whereas a post mill would hold to a position where, um, yes, Jesus is coming, uh, definitely he's uh, coming back to establish his kingdom, uh, literally, but at the same time they go into mission field knowing that the, the mission, the good news of Jesus, not just informs their spiritual being, but also what they do while they are alive here in this world that God has given them. Yeah, it, I, I'm not aware of a study that really has a, a substantial enough data to show that dispensationalists are engaged in this type of missions, um, post-millennials are engaged in this type of missions, all millennials. I, I suppose you could just look historically at, it is definitely the case that people from all eschatological viewpoints have been heavily engaged in missions. Yeah. Uh, and that by doing that, they've been engaged in all the different efforts of missions from church planning, medical missions, education, um, you know, kind of top-down advocacy at the, at the government level to grassroots, uh, help, the, help the neighbor, you know. So I, my hunch is, and I'm kind of cynical here, that unfortunately human beings are so comfortable with um, not acting on what they believe that my hunch is people's eschatology does not play a big part in the actual decisions they make about missions because people tend to not act on the beliefs that they say they believe. Mm. At the same time, it shouldn't be that way. It should be more as to right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all of our, 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 all of teaching, that's what we're going, going, going to go and teach, right? To the nations that all that Jesus has taught us. And I think eschatology is a major part of that as well in terms of uh, what the scripture teaches us. Um, uh, having said that, let me uh, ask you, given your experience and uh, your engagement with missions and in teaching uh, about missiology and all, um, are you optimistic about missions, uh, global missions, missions here in the West? And also, what are some of the challenges that you're foreseeing? Yeah. Um, I, I believe that the role of the uh, Western church will increasingly be one of education and uh, capacity building for local churches, local church leaders. So I think that there's still a tremendous need. While the need may not be that the Western church continue to export more and more denominations, um, although there are places in the world where there are, you know, there are no Calvary chapels, no Saddlebacks, no Southern Baptist churches, you know. Mm -hmm. um, in general, in, in many places in the world, there is still a tremendous need for the local church to, and a, and a hunger for the local church to receive the um, training that we have, both the practical theology, here's how to minister to people in need, here's how to counsel people, you know, in times of tragedy, here's how to explain the gospel, here's how to exegete the meaning from scripture. So there is a lot of room for theological training. So I don't think missions is on its way out. Hmm. I also think that the numbers show that um, there's the number of people being sent into missions is still growing. Uh, the work that we're being engaged in does seem to be changing. There are fewer and fewer people each three years when the uh, North American Mission Handbook comes out, fewer and fewer being engaged in, in the primary work of proclamation and discipleship. Hmm. And so we're at this tipping point now where I think we're now over 50% say their primary work is something other than church planting proclamation. Uh, now, is that missions? Um, it's definitely sent. It's definitely cross-cultural. The question is, how, is, how close 
uh, does that align with cross-cultural discipleship? If you're doing medical missions, um, if you're digging wells, uh, it is possible, I think, to be making disciples in those efforts, and it's possible to not be making disciples in, in, in those situations. Uh, so, yeah, I do think that the way that churches are engaged in missions, we went through a time where it was really about stop establishing denominations. We kind of went through a time when the sodality was in its heyday, the YWAMs, the Bible translators, those are not in their heyday now. Hmm. Um, and so I don't know what the next heyday is, uh, but I think that there will st still be huge amounts of Christian mover, moving cross-culturally and living, you know, a Christian witness to the people around them. Wonderful. Um, this was a great discussion, and uh, I, I loved your thoughts, and I highly recommend our listeners to um, look into this book, uh, buy it. You know, if you're in missiology, if you're in missions, you're teaching, or you are a student, uh, I'll highly recommend this award-winning book by Dr. Narbas. Again, the title is Advanced Missiology, how to study missions in credible and useful ways. Uh, Dr. Narbas, if someone wishes to get in touch with you, what's the best way uh, to learn about you and also uh, your ministry? Okay, well, uh, my name's a little hard to uh, memorize the spelling of, but I'll, I'll just mention it here. My, my email address is K, and then my last name, N-E-H-R-B-A-S-S, -S, uh, at calbaptist.edu. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Nerebus, again for your time. And uh, I'm sure uh, there, there are a lot of people reading your book and they surely be blessed by your wisdom and your experience. I want to thank all our listeners for your time. Uh, and I encourage you to join us again for our next episode, which will be very soon. Have a wonderful day. Take care.